see Max uh, Scott uh, that uh, it, we're always uh, excited to hear from uh, that we'll be listening to shortly. And then is Crystal Porter the uh, representative Maverick? Yes, I'm on. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so this is where uh, Ms. Porter, I usually have uh, the applicant explain a little bit about your business. I think most of us are aware, but uh, I wanna offer you the same opportunity. And I did note some different things that I don't necessarily frequently see at a Maverick, such as like a, uh, uh, some eating options. So why don't you tell me or explain to council exactly what's going on with Maverick and uh, a little bit about your business philosophy and how you plan to operate. Okay, yeah. So we are currently out of Utah um, and we do have some stores out in Grand Junction. Uh, we're a convenience store, a Ventures First Stop. So we have fuel, um, your regular convenience store items. Um, we also have the food portion. Um, we do a made to order. We do um, a warmer full of food just to grab as you go. We have high full of diesel fuel just for your adventures. Um, and then we have our, our beer ball and our just kind of one stop shop for your adventure. So uh, we're most familiar the restaurant food or uh, gas station food is being the warm up stuff. And I have one of my assistant city attorneys that seems to live off of uh, gas station food. So I'm excited to hear that you're actually doing some um, cook to order as well. Yes, yes, there's some good stuff, burritos, all kinds of good stuff, so. Okay, I will expect a far healthier uh, assistant city attorney uh, for public safety <laughs> now. Uh, so uh, tell us a little bit about um, how alcohol plays into uh, your game plan, the business plan at Maverick, and what type of uh, alcohol are you uh, selling? Okay, so we are selling um, obviously the 6% now, um, mainly just um, a little bit of, um, I'm trying to think, sorry, you got me stumped of what I'm thinking of. Um, so we have our typical brands, Coors, Bud Light. We're just going to have the, the packs that you buy and the single 24 ounce cans. Um, we have our beer vault that we have, um, locked doors for non-operating hours. We keep that locked. Um, we have age restrictions on the register that pop up. We also do training. Um, a computer-based training that we have all um, adventure guides, everybody on our team that has to take that and be certified and be aware of all the laws. Um, I don't know what else. <laughs> okay. um, you hit a lot of the stuff, but I just want to go a little bit deeper. Um, we love at the city those uh, point of sale systems where you either scan the ID or it's not just something that uh, you can ignore um, the IDs or the age when uh, things start getting busy. So uh, we, how, how is your system working in that? Um, yeah, so we, when you scan it, it'll prompt and ask. Um, and right now, currently you can scan the ID or enter the ID, um, the birthday in. Um, we advise all of our adventure guys to personally scan the IDs. That's the best practice that we that we have. Okay. And so does it matter what uh, age the person is? If uh, Counselor Anderson, who looks a little bit older than uh, what we necessarily <laughs> need to be ID, if he comes in, are you going to scan his ID? Yes, it prompts for um, 50 or older. Is what it puts me in an awkward situation, Roy. I think you're right at that uh, at that the midpoint. Yeah, I'm, ru I'm really close, right? Right in that range. <laughs> um, so uh, you talked about training uh, of your employees, and I think that that's what we've always found. Um, nobody wants to sell 
uh, well, very few people ever want to sell to uh, underage people. So it's always the, it comes down to training of what you do when you get slammed and there's a long line. Um, and one of the things we found very helpful is what's sometimes called as the tips class, but the alcohol servers class, which also has an awful lot for um, package and retail. Do you require that your employees go through that type of training? Yeah, we do. Now, um, are you, what is your position with this uh, specific store? Um, I'm going to be the district manager. And how many uh, stores do you uh, supervise in your district? Um, this will be nine for me. Okay. And then all the other eight also sell uh, alcohol? Correct, yes. Uh, and you're familiar uh, with the uh, laws in the, of the uh, state of Colorado when it comes to the sale of alcohol? Yes. And uh, besides the uh, moral character of the applicant, we need to look at the needs of the city. And one of the ways uh, we determine needs of the city is through um, is through um, petitions and and different um, polling and things like that. And I believe you uh, have engaged Max 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 Scott uh, to look at that issue for Maverick. Is that correct? I believe so. Yes. So why don't we? Uh, Max is already unmiked. And uh, we'll turn it over to Max. And this is kind of where I sit back and let him take it away because he does a pretty good thorough job. So Max, what do you have for us today? Um, I don't have a, uh, a video and I put on a dress shirt and a Tabasco tie. I guess all I'm gonna have is audio. <laughs> uh, thank you all um, as a veteran for uh, saying the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, some jurisdictions don't do that anymore. Um, uh, my name is Max Scott. I own and operate Oedipus Incorporated. We're in our 52nd year. Next year, we're going to pass into our 53rd. Um, and I may be getting out of the petitioning business. There's a long story behind that. Uh, but in any case, we were retained and paid in advance um, on this survey. Do you folks have a copy of my report? I believe it goes to our, our city clerk who looks it over and is able to, uh, to give us a summary. I was going to refer you to um, the last page in the report. Uh, do they have that, Lisa? Um, Mayor Bynum, the, um, the overall summary was included in the meeting packet. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Um, well, uh, on the last page of our survey report is a map of the jurisdiction which is the municipal limits of the city of Montrose. I love doing business over here. You guys are friendly, you're pro-business. And that lady, Lisa, she's the gateway for new businesses going into Montrose. I wish we were doing it there. Uh, anyway, uh, on that page is a map of the city um, and the um, parties and in interest per the statute are business owners and managers, residents of the defined neighborhood. So the green area um, on the map are generally where the businesses are located. I know you folks know all of that. Uh, and then uh, around the city, giving a geographical representation, uh, are the residents of the defined neighborhood. And they are highlighted in pink. Um, I can't remember if I said this. I do it too many times or maybe not enough. Uh, we were paid in advance. This is a great client. You send them a bill. And a few days later, if the post office doesn't screw it up, you get payment in full. Um, the survey report uh, provides you with the days that the survey um, was conducted. Uh, this was done by Mark Steffick, one of our most experienced uh, surveyors. Going to page two, uh, item number one, I'm reporting to the client we did what we contracted to do, which was an attempt to contact 431 parties in interest. In so doing, uh, we had 37 businesses favoring, uh, two against, residences 146 favoring, 11 against. 
in a petition format that I copyrighted in 1974. And that little circle with a C in it doesn't mean anything to anybody. Everybody plagiarizes it. Uh, but anyway, I developed this format. You can sign for or against, and we encourage you to write in any reason you'd like to communicate to the liquor authority. Usually it's the people that oppose the license application that write it in. We had four, no need. In other words, some remark to the um, effect that there were enough FMB licenses in the defined neighborhood. Uh, five people had an abhorrence of alcohol. That's a desire reason only, not des uh, need and desire, which is the conjunctive issue. And four miscellaneous reasons. So if you go to the uh, survey results for, for or against for whatever reason, uh, the survey result is 93% favoring the issuance of the license. And if you buy our argument and um, um, eliminate the desire reasons only, uh, the survey result goes to, if you round up, 98%. These are the kind of results we get in with on-premise licenses primarily hotel and restaurant licenses or beer and wine. They're excellent survey results. So it um, argues that there are not enough FMB licenses in the defined neighborhood and uh, the license should be granted, but I don't vote you do. Um, I would like to also remark about what's gonna happen in 2021. The alcohol industry for on-premise licenses is going right into the toilet. It's circling the bowl right now. And hopefully um, you don't have uh, restaurants that are going out of business. Lots and lots of my clients have gone out of business here in uh, the Denver metropolitan area. That's Colorado Springs up to Fort Collins. This is what happened when Carter was president. So the only applications that are probably gonna be filed is off premise licenses. People don't stop drinking and they don't stop eating. It's where they buy it uh, and consume it. And I hope you folks uh, make it okay through the uh, coming year. But I, it's scary, all these private small uh, uh, businesses, uh, family-owned businesses are just going broke. Bank, banks aren't going to lend to them either. So now that I've had my horn toot, oh, 1216 Tipperary Street and unincorporated. Boulder County. Now, Barbara knows what that's all about. <laughs> so, uh, are, uh, do you have any questions? Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Scott about the survey that shows the applicant has met uh, or has passed a pretty high threshold for the needs and desires of the community? So, okay. So, we can thank Mr. Scott for the survey and the editorial comments as well. I have one more thing to say. You want me to tell my family hi? Yeah. Oh, there are two more things to say. In our house, we say Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to everybody. Happy thank, New Year. Thank you very much, Mr. Scott. And it has been a pleasure knowing you for 27 years. Um, I'll be here until I don't wake up in the morning. We'll miss you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving along. So do, um, does anyone on council have any questions for our, um, our city attorney or the applicant about this liquor license and the, um, the conditions that they've uh, applied under? Mr. Anderson. So I, I have a question for um, Ms. Porter. Um, I, I wanted to pose a hypothetical situation and, and see how your clerks are trained. If a person comes in and they bring a six pack of beer up to the checkout counter and uh, you can smell alcohol on their breath and they're slurring their speech, what, what, does, the, what does the clerk train to do? <clears throat> so they are trained to move the beer away and deny the sell. So we don't sell if we you know, know that they're intoxicated in any way. Good, good. I, I hate the idea of drinking and driving. So I appreciate that policy. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Any other questions from my fellow counselors? Okay, then we um, will hold a hearing and that allows any public who wish to um, speak on this item, their opportunity. So officially opening a hearing on this liquor license application. 
Do you take any input from our uh, youth counselor? Um, I would be happy to. Um, hang on, let me make sure I don't have any public comment first by double checking that list. And I don't see anyone who's trying to raise their hand in our public. How about our youth counselor? Um, Gunnison, you are, I don't believe, old enough to be purchasing alcohol. That being said, do you have any questions about how this liquor license application works or for Ms. Porter, who is the district manager for the new Maverick? No, no questions. Um, just want to say all the policies, uh, the way they're trained, this all sounds great. Uh, sounds like a really neat, exciting opportunity for a new travel stop here in Montrose, growing recreation, growing as a tourist destination. This is an exciting addition to that. And, uh, so far, everything has sounded great. It's correct. I won't be able to, uh, I won't be affected by this, uh, by this liquor license for a few years yet. But as far as I can tell, everything sounds great. And uh, yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. So I don't see anyone else wanting to make a comment or ask a question. So um, I will close the hearing officially um, and then ask um, someone to make a motion. Here, I'll make a motion to consider an application for a beer and wine liquor license. Oh, hang on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you because I want to make sure we get the right liquor, the right type of liquor license. So it's this one is the fermented malt beverage license. Yes. On item number eight. Item, yes, fermented malt. Beverage license at 1140 North Townsend Avenue for Maverick Incorporated, doing business as the Maverick Incorporated number 616 for consumption off premise of the license. I'll second uh, Mayor Pro Tem's motion. Great. We have a first and a second. So I will turn it over to Ms. Del Piccolo for the vote. Harper Bynum? Aye. Ned Glasgow? Aye. Roy Anderson? Aye. Dave Bowman? Aye. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. So that lets us go on to our next agenda item. Um, thank you. Good evening. Which is, thank you, um, which is we're skipping nine. Remember that got pulled from our agenda tonight. So we're going straight to 10, which is a brew pub liquor license application. And so this is council consideration of an application for a new brew public or license at 512 East Main Street for San Juan Brews LLC doing business as San Juan Brews to sell malt, vineyards, and spiritus liquor to the public for consumption on the license premise and to sell malt liquor beverages manufactured on the license premises and packaged in sealed containers for consumption off the license premises. So with that, I will turn it over to our city attorney, Stephen Alcorn, for the introduction and the process. Okay, so uh, John and Kevin, I'm kind of excited about this. So tell us what you got. So we, we are opening up San Juan Brews LLC. And so this is gonna be a brew house where we're gonna be selling craft coffee beverages and on-site uh, craft small batch beer. Uh, my wife and I are the owners of San Juan Mobile Coffee here in town. We own the coffee truck. And so we're moving our operations from the truck indoors. And then Kevin and Chelsea are, and are coming in as the uh, small batch craft brewing component of the uh, partnership. So basically we can start our day and end our day with your business. Exactly. That's absolutely yes. the plan. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, you're nicely convenient, uh, situated to the office. So um, I'd like <laughs> to tell people where you're going to be. Yes. So we're going to be at 512 East Main. Uh, so it's uh, uh, people that are familiar with Montrose. That's uh, used to be, I think, Colorado Bank for a while. We had Zulu Brewing in this location. And right previous to us, it was in Transic. We've uh, done a complete renovation of the building. We left some of this previous structure, but it is pretty well in, in the last three months been renovated from uh, front to back uh, and in preparation for the, the, the combined uh, craft house business. So 
you're in a unique situation because you're you're going to be getting or marketing to various age groups. So I'm sure that you want that after high school crowd to come in and have a craft coffee, um, but uh, we don't want that same individual to be having one of your craft beers. So what are you going to do to uh, control that and make sure that you're not uh, serving to uh, minors? So our, uh, any of our liquors that are gonna be sold, uh, whether it be the uh, adult coffees or the craft beers, upon request from the customer, it prompts an immediate ID check um, without exception. Uh, so, uh, and we were kind of listening to some of your previous questions from your previous client and, uh, you know, we, it's, it's the four of us. It's my wife and I and Kevin and Chelsea and saying we, we're all in on this thing and we absolutely cannot risk putting our business in jeopardy by making unwise decisions and serving underage clients. And we just, we can't afford to make that risk and we absolutely refuse to jeopardize that in any capacity. So regardless of if they look like they're 100 or if they look like they're 21, they get ID checked, period. And if they're not able to provide it, they get to buy coffee instead. So there's always an alternative. Okay. So, so I think you described the range between Gunnison and, and Doug, but uh, <laughs> looking at my screen. <laughs> so um, what are we going to be uh, expecting when we come into uh, San Juan Brew? I mean, well, so what are you looking like? like? Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. What is it going to be looking like? What are you going to be selling besides those? Is there going to be food? Uh, let's give a little opportunity for you to uh, kind of toot your uh, business's horn, but also give council an idea of what's coming to town. Sure. So we're really excited about it. So, um, you know, one of the first things that you guys will be seeing when we get the doors open in January is we're going to be installing, uh, we're replacing the windows on the front of the building with garage doors and we're replacing the back entrance to the building with garage doors. So you will be able to have bar, bar style seating at, on the sidewalk out on Main Street. So you can actually sit on the sidewalk and have uh, uh, beverages right at the counter, or you can sit inside the building and, and have an outside view with the, with the windows open, completely open air. The back of the building will be able to open up the garage door and we'll have picnic tables and open air seating back there as well. So as you all are, if you're familiar with this location, it does not have great patio um, opportunities, but I think we've been creative and uh, brought the outdoors in for folks so that you can get a, a patio experience, but still be uh, within the building. Uh, when you come inside, you'll see that the uh, um, the espresso bar and the coffee bar have all been inter intertwined with each other. We've taken a lot of care in making sure that you can come in and you can see a coffee shop or you can see the craft brewery. Um, uh, and it's you, you'll be able to recognize both atmospheres right away. Um, the, our wives have done a great job, <coughs> excuse me, um, kind of creating a nice warm atmosphere. We got a lot of, uh, couches and, and real comfortable seating. Um, with the city's help, this location has, uh, got fiber running to it. So we've got, uh, internet in here and the plan, our goal is, is to advertise this also as a, um, place for our telecommuters to come hang out. We really want people to come in, sit down, uh, work from home, work from here have a coffee, um, transition into the afternoon, maybe have that beer. Uh, we will be serving some uh, uh, quick heat type foods from the bar, but my wife and I, because we ran the coffee truck, we built great relationships with all the uh, food trucks between here and Grand Junction. As of right now, we've got 10 different food trucks from Montrose to Grand Junction that are gonna be in our rotation. We're bringing down some of the food trucks from Grand Junction and we hope we're going to be putting them off the back in Centennial Plaza. So every day you get you come in, you can enjoy your favorite beverage, but your uh, menu options for food will be different every night. So we're hoping to do that and keep keep the keep the atmosphere ever changing and, and ever different. Okay, we talked about uh, service to minors, but you uh, touched on something inadvertently that's also a big concern, which is over service. So you're going to be encouraging uh, the uh, the couch surfers or the uh, the telecommuters uh, to be working from one of your uh, your couches, um, and but we're also concerned about over service. Uh, though I'm concerned about over service of caffeine, that's not illegal, 
Uh, so uh, I think it's uh, more uh, pertinent today to talk about over service of alcohol. So how are you going to make sure that uh, that that uh, commute that uh, telecommuter that comes in sits down and uh, has been working through numerous beers throughout the day, uh, making his workday go a little faster, uh, doesn't over imbibe. Sure, and I'll chime in here just a little bit. Um, so I, I think that really just comes down to exactly what John was saying in the beginning is, you know, anytime an alcoholic beverage is ordered, it's an illicit response ID. From there, myself, John, to be an Chelsea, we'll gauge, um, obviously, they're either running a tab or we know exactly how many beers they've been served. Um, I've taken an alcohol course before, and I know that's something that we're looking out to save serve or serve save um, online training as well. And I know there's another program through the city, I believe, um, it is just really gauging um, how fast those people are drinking. Uh, as John mentioned as well, we have a lot riding on this, and that's not something we're willing to jeopardize. So I spent the last year and a half at Colorado Boy uh, bartending, and it was a weekend manager. So our limit was three. As soon as someone hit that three mark, it was, here's a water, here's a coffee, let's get you something to eat. And that's going to be very similar to what we're doing as well. Um, we don't want the atmosphere. We want people to come in with, you know, obviously with minors, and if that's the case for coffee, hot chocolate, we don't want to be a bar. We're not doing shots. We're not doing any of that um, type of thing. And, and for me, being a brewer, the beauty of craft beer for me is the enjoyment the conversation over a pint or two, not getting crazy. You want to do that, then this isn't the place for you. Um, we're very, very strict on that. Um, we hold our names behind this, our quality of our product, and we don't want that to get um, diluted with, with issues of people being overserved, and that's just something we won't do. Um, and uh, you mentioned the alcohol server training course. Is that something that uh, you can commit to council that uh, your various servers will take part in? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Hundred um, percent. Is there a particular brew at this point you guys are pretty proud of? Oh yeah. <laughs> so Kevin makes a lot a, of them. But... Yeah, there's a lot of them. But uh, so we're a brew house. We're combining coffee and craft beer. So Kevin makes a fantastic oatmeal stout. We're very proud of our cold brew, so we're going to have a coffee oatmeal stout that's going to be the house regular. Yep. Okay. Uh, I tried to break up the uh, more mundane questions with a couple of <laughs> interesting ones. Uh, so let's uh, talk to the needs of the community. Sure. So uh, we need to determine that the community wishes your uh, liquor license to be um, granted. Uh, and I noticed a petition was done. 124 signatures were submitted. Uh, 29 were determined to be insufficient, mainly due to outside the city limits. 95 signatures were determined to be valid in support of the license. Um, I'll hit kind of the highlights of some of the comments. Uh, Montrose needs a brew pub. Um, I'm not sure if there was sarcasm there or not, but it does have an explanation point. Uh, there are great uh, people to run this type of business. Great, I uh, great idea. Love the idea. Five people said that. Love their coffee and small business. Um, I guess the coffee is just a plus since you don't need a license for that. Uh, but people do like your coffee. They said another one says their coffee is tasty. Great addition to the community is five uh, comments. Uh, please open four. Good luck to. Yes, with multiple explanation points. Please, with multiple explanation points. Beer, with one explanation point. Lots of fun. Can't wait. So excited to have a new home base. I think you're going to make some money off of that person. Um, <laughs> so what, what other, besides the uh, petitions, how do you know that the community wants uh, a license to be granted uh, for you to sell sell alcohol? You know, we, uh, we, my wife and I, when we started selling mobile coffee, it was a five-year plan for us. We had intended on hopefully getting into a brick and mortar in five years. Uh, it's converted into a five-month plan. And so uh, the community has really been receptive of what we've been doing on the truck. And, and one of the things that we've heard over and over and over again on the truck that Kevin has heard as well whenever he, whenever he's been working at his his jobs is that 
the community is going to see a lot of things where they can call just home that's got great customer service like this room. Room. Um, with family. And that's what we're trying to do here. You know, we're, we're not trying to create another bar atmosphere. We are trying to play, create a place where people can bring their kids and they can hang out and have a good time and uh, um, enjoy, enjoy a, a new product um, being delivered to them in a way that it hasn't been delivered in Montrose. Thank you. Um, Madam Mayor, I think that covers the various things that I like to cover, plus a few other things. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you very much. And I want to thank John and Kevin for both being here tonight to talk us through all that and to talk about your new business. I think we are always excited when someone decides to invest their time and their money and their talents in our community. And uh, we couldn't be more excited for you guys in that regard and wish your business the best. Thank you. Um, Council, do you guys have any questions that pertain either to the business or the liquor license application? I see Mayor Pro Tem Glasspell with his hand up. Yes, I have one question for John and Kevin. If you have a customer that appears might be inebriated or has had too many drinks, how do you assist them in getting home or what do you do with them? So the, the first the first response is that you just you stop the serving, and um, you know then as Kevin kind of alluded to earlier we you know we we help them sober up you know we get them to drink in the water we get them some food in their system, and then um, you know there are opportunities for people to get transportation in town. We've got a great transit company with the busing systems. Um, there is some Uber services around town that we intend on keeping the phone numbers available, but. Um, you know, we, we, we're going to do the best we can to, to help these folks, uh, um, leave the building sober and able to be safe in the community and not, not cause any problems. I mean, you, you had commented on it earlier. One of the things that scares you the most is a drunk driver. Um, we agree, you know, we've got kids that we don't want to see, you know, getting hurt. We got family members in this community. Um, you know, we, we do not want to participate in anybody being, hurt because of the business we put up here. We're, we're, our goal is to make sure that we're safe and the people that are leaving this building are getting home safe as well. Thank you. Councilor Anderson, I see your hand. Um, so this license, as I understand it, you can also sell beer in a container that people can take home sure. off premises. How is that sealed? I mean, is I'm just curious how, how that sure so we'll, we'll provided have two, options, two options that um, we we're not going to open with um, but one is a 64 ounce glass growler is what it's called so basically the jug it's a half gallon um, and that is sealed with a twist cap um, which is sealed and that's um, uh, allowed that way there's another uh, option um, it's called a crawler so it's a 32 ounce or a 16 ounce can that we have an in-house seamer so you'd be able to seal that package right in there, can't open it, you know, it's the traditional pull tab uh, beer can uh, style, but that would be obviously closed and not able to open until they choose to, to do so. Obviously at home would be the, the best option for that. So those are the only two options that currently we're gonna be doing. I think some of our other local brew pubs employ similar methods. Correct, yeah, Horsefly, Two Rascals, Colorado Boy have both of those um, as okay. well open out their doors. All right, thank you. <clears throat> yes. Any other questions from council or from our youth counselor on this application? Okay, then we are required to hold a hearing. Did someone say something? Sorry. Okay, so we are required to hold a hearing um, for any public comment on this item. So I'll open up a hearing and ask if anyone in our attendees list would like to speak for or against this liquor license application. I don't see anyone, if anyone else does, please interrupt me, correct me, but I just, I'm not seeing anyone, so I'm gonna keep us moving along um, and close the hearing and entertain a motion from a counselor. Madam Mayor, I'd move to approve a brew pub license at 512 East Main Street for San Juan Brews, LLC, doing business as San Juan Brews to sell malt, venus, and spiritus liquor to public for consumption on the license premise 
and to sell malt liquor beverages manufactured on the license premise and packaged in sealed containers for consumption off of the license premise. A second. Great, we have a motion and a second. So now we'll take a vote. Barbara Bynum. Aye. Doug Glasgow. Aye. Roy Anderson. Aye. Dave Bowman. Aye. Dave Frank. Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Great, uh, congratulations to our applicants. Uh, we wish you the best of luck and thanks for coming to our city council meeting tonight. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you guys, nice. appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Look forward to seeing everybody. Okay, moving along on our agenda tonight, we're out of the liquor business and into the land business. Um, the first one is item 11, is the Hilltop Edition 2 annexation. And I will turn it over to the city senior planner, Amy Sharp, who will introduce the whole annexation concept and then council will accept public comment and take a vote on the resolution and then accept public comment in a hearing and take a vote on the ordinance. But Ms. Sharp will introduce the whole, the whole piece to us. Great. Hey, right. thank you, Mayor Bynum. I'm gonna start with sharing my screen for my presentation here. And as you mentioned, um, this is a complete presentation on the annexation and the zoning um, kind of combined. So the first slide, you guys are familiar with this. This shows the annexation schedule. Um, we started this back at work session on October 19th, um, had a planning commission zoning hearing on November 18th, and then tonight is the first reading. This parcel is a really small kind of slither parcel. It's about half an acre in size, a little less than that. It's located north of Locust Road, and it's the west side right of way of the 6600 road. It's shown by this orange parcel here. So as I mentioned, this parcel is point, it's just under half an acre. It's 0.45 acres. It is within the city's urban growth boundary, boundary the city tri-county water service area and city sewer service area. Um, as you can see from this map, um, it is surrounded on the east side and some on the south side by city limits as shown by that gray area. So it is um, eligible for annexation. The zoning of the surrounding area is R2 to the south, which is considered low density district, and then R4 high density district over to the right. Um, that's part of the hilltop um, addition that you guys approved back in July of this year. And then there's agricultural over to the west, which is still in the county, not in the city limits. Um, and kind of just to reiterate, this is kind of a cleanup annexation. We did the hilltop annexation back in July, as I mentioned, um, to do this area that's to the east, that's R4. And at that time, we did not bring in the um, county road right away on the other side um, since it wasn't the applicant's property. And so we're just cleaning that up at this point and bringing that into the city limits as well. So the R4 high density district is intended to provide for high density multifamily residences and to allow for variable densities. Um, however, this is just a county road right of way. So there's no development planned on this parcel. We're just um, proposing to zone it the same as the other side of the road for the sake of consistency. This map shows the actual annexation map, which is also in your packet. According to our comprehensive plan, this area is in this uh, area that's yellow. So that's residential mixed density medium in the future land use map. And this is also in your packet, so I won't read through all of that, but this gives you an example of um, some of the land uses that are designated in this area. This is also in our growth area one. So it's kind of that reddish area. The growth area one is the area of the city where infrastructure is already in place or is nearby and it's suitable for urban levels of development. So the area is urbanizing and more than one six is contiguous to the city limits. An annexation agreement is not required. This is just county road right of way. Um, the proposal is consistent with the public health, safety and welfare, our annexation policies and the comprehensive plan. The Planning Commission did recommend approval of the R4 High Density District at the November 18th meeting, and staff is recommending approval of both the annexation and the R4 High Density District for this property. Right. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for presenting that. 
Um, council, um, including our youth counselor, are there any questions for Ms. Sharp about the annexation portion of this? Because we're going to address that first. Yes, Mayor Pro Tem Glasgow. I'd just like to comment. I had asked Amy an interesting question. I did not realize that our streets in town uh, carry a zoning matching the housing areas that are around them. For some reason, I sort of had anticipated they would be P or public, but she did explain it to me, and I think that's just fine. Anyone I else? Had, yeah. I had one question, um, but I think Amy sufficiently answered it, and that was, uh, is this uh, annexation uh, just for the purpose of convenience, since the city has the one side of the right of way annexing the other so uh just for the convenience of that i'm just wondering if construction is required on that road and in, in the future on both sides this would make it easier to do that at the same time correct you're exactly right so obviously we don't want just half of the road annex and the other half left open especially if we're able to bring the other side in it helps us with both emergency services and help with um, determining who gets to you know who gets to <laughs> maintain that road you know for snow removal or other purposes so you're exactly right I think, All right, excellent thank you i think mr clamp that you summed it up pretty well mm -hmm. any other um questions Okay, then I will accept public comment on the resolution and the resolution is 2020-28 and that's the findings of facts for the annexation. Are there any public comments for that portion? I am not seeing any and so um, would entertain a motion. I would move that we approve resolution 2020-28 uh, on first reading, or actually it's not first reading, we just approve it. Correct. I'll second that. Great, we have a first and a second, so I will ask for the vote to be taken. Barbara Bynum? Aye. Doug Glasbell? Aye. Roy Anderson? Aye. Dave Bowman? Aye. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. And so we move on to the second piece of the annexation, which is ordinance 2521 on first reading. And this is the ordinance that annexes the Hilltop 2 addition. And for this um, ordinance, we hold a public hearing. So I'll open up the hearing and ask if there's any public comment on this. I do not see any. So I will close the hearing and um, entertain a motion. Madam Mayor, I'll make a motion that we pass ordinance 2521 on first reading as presented. Second. Great, we have a first and a second, so let's have a vote. Barbara Bynum? Aye. Doug Glassbell? Aye. Roy Anderson? Aye. Dave Bowman? Aye. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Great, thank you very much. So then we move on to item 12, which is the zoning portion of this same property. And it is ordinance 2522. It's a first reading and it um, provides for the zoning of the Hilltop Addition 2 as an R4 high density district. And I believe that um, Ms. Sharp had already explained everything she needed to explain, um, but we do hold hearings, public hearings for ordinances so I will officially open up a hearing and ask if there's any public comment for the zoning of this half of this part of a road. I don't see any, so I'll close the hearing and um, entertain a motion or any comments or questions from council. That's always an option too. Okay. Madam Mayor, I'd move to approve or to pass ordinance 2522 on first reading as presented. Second that. I, I don't know who seconded it. I know I know Give it the dog. Okay, Councillor Frank was the was the first and Mayor Pro Tem Glassball with the second. And so we'll call for a vote. Barbara Bynum? Aye. Doug Glassbell? Aye. Roy Anderson? Aye. Dave Bowman? Aye. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. 
great. Thank you very much. And that whole process of annexing via resolution and an ordinance and then zoning via an ordinance, we're going to do again just to make sure we've got it down and we understand how the process works. Um, but this time we're on agenda item 13, and this is the rainbow trout addition annexation. And I will turn it over to senior planner Amy Sharp, who will talk us through both the annexation portion and the zoning portion. And we'll do it just like we did a minute ago, but with a new piece of property. Take it away. Hey, thanks, Mayor. <laughs> I'd say you guys are pros at these annexations by now. So <laughs> next the you'll be The process should be routine. And yet each new property we should inspect very carefully. Right. All right, so here's the annexation schedule for this one. Um, we started with work session back in October. Um, Planning Commission zoning hearing was also November 18th and first reading is tonight. This one's a little different because it's a city owned property. Um, so this will kind of operate a little differently as far as our schedule wind and some other things. So this one is highlighted here again in orange. It is um, north of Spring Creek Road. It's west of the river and it's kind of northeast of Marine Road. It is 2.82 acres in size. It's also within the city's urban growth boundary, the city of Montrose Water Service Area, Tri-County Water Service Area, and West Montrose Sanitation District. Um, as you can see from this map, um, it's surrounded quite a bit by city limits, all except for there on the western side. So the zoning of the surrounding area is P, public. It's all that green that you see on almost every, really every side, except for the west side, which is not in city limits and is agricultural. So this kind of describes what the P district does provide. Um, there are no plans right now for development of this parcel, but um, as a city owned property right next to the river, it just made sense to um, zone it as P public as all the other properties are in that area. This is the official annexation map that's also in your packet. And in our comprehensive plan, um, the little black dot there points to being located in the green area. So this is listed as River Greenway Regional Park in our future land use map, which falls under both public and also parks and open space land uses. So again, I'm going to let you guys read through that. I know it's in your packet as well. I won't read that word for word, but you can see um, in the comprehensive plan what the different types of uses are um, in that area. This one is located in the yellow area. So that's growth area two. Um, according to our comprehensive plan, growth area two is outside of the current city limits. Um, but it does consist of some level of infrastructure or moderate proximity to existing infrastructure. So as you saw from our previous maps, the area is urbanizing and more than one six is contiguous to city limits. An annexation agreement is not required as it's city owned property. The proposal is consistent with the public health, safety and welfare, our annexation policies and the comprehensive plan. Planning Commission did recommend approval of the P Public District at the November 18th meeting, and staff is recommending approval of both the annexation and the P Public District. All right, thanks. Great, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate that. Are there any questions from Council or Youth Council representative tonight about the um, annexation or the zoning? Right, pretty straightforward, except like you said, it is uh, owned by the city. And so that's a little different than some of the properties that we um, annex and zone. So that being said, the process takes us through these different steps. The first one is resolution 2020-29, which is the findings of fact for the annexation of the rainbow trout edition. And we do invite public comment for this resolution. So I'll see if there is any public comment. I'm not seeing any, um, so we can entertain a motion um, for that resolution. I move that we approve resolution 2020-29 as presented. Second. Thank you. We have a motion by Councillor Bowman and a second by Councillor Frank. So let's vote. Barbara Bynum. Aye. Doug Glassbell. Aye. Roy Anderson? Aye. 
Dave Bowman? Aye. Dave Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. And so the second step in annexing properties is now the ordinance. And this is ordinance 2523 on first reading. And it is an ordinance that would annex the rainbow trout addition. And for ordinances, we always hold a hearing for public comment. So I will officially open up a hearing and ask if there is any public comment on this. I do not see any, so I'll close the hearing and turn it back over to my fellow counselors for um, question, discussion, or a motion. I move to pass ordinance 2523 on first reading as presented. I second it. Thanks. We've got a motion by Councilor Frank and a second by Councilor Anderson. So we'll take a vote. Barbara Bynum? Aye. Doug Glasgow? Aye. Roy Anderson? Aye. Dave Bowman? Aye. Mayor Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Great, thank you very much. So now we move on to item 14, which is the zoning portion of this property. And we do that with an ordinance. So this is ordinance 2524 on first reading. And this is an ordinance that would provide for the zoning of the rainbow trout edition as P public. And for um, first readings on ordinances, we hold a hearing for the purposes of public comment. So I'll officially open a hearing and ask if there's any public comment on this ordinance. I don't see any, so I will close the hearing and turn it back over to my fellow counselors for comment, questions, or a motion. Mayor, I'll make a motion pass ordinance 2524 on the first reading as presented. Second. Uh, that was a motion by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Glasgow and a second by Councilor Frank, I believe. Great, okay. And um, I'm going through these really fast to Gunnison and I apologize because I usually try and ask if you have any comments and you usually say something really interesting. So I'm gonna just pause for, before we vote and ask you if you have any comments about these annexations and these zonings. Yeah, no problem. Uh, no, well, maybe I do have one question. So the, uh, we're calling this the rainbow trout edition. So just as a fisherman, I'm curious about that. Is there, or will there be developed on this property at any point, any sort of uh, fishing access out there? I know most of the, most of the fishing access here is down at river bottom, but the city starting to get more spots to the north so i'm wondering if that is that's a planned use for this property or or near there ah it's we almost couldn't have teed it up better because isn't this the section miss sharp right where we're doing river improvements or nearby where we currently are doing river improvements to make that water um, really fishable with grant money and um does anyone want to add on to to that information it is really close to there. Um, I don't know of any immediate plans right now for um, improvements to the area. I don't know if Anne knows of any further either. Um, it's just, I don't know. I'll we'll ask her if she knows of any. This is what's already been said that we um, purchased that parcel as part of our plans for the river rehabilitation project that's underway. Um, and as a quick plug, when you walk on the river trail now, um, adjacent to the URA area and um, where the Mayfly building is, you can see the river rehabilitation project in process. But um, as I understand it, most of the remaining lands there are wetlands, so we wouldn't build anything. So there wouldn't be development in that way, but it's really excellent for the city to have ownership of that parcel. And that makes it, sense. Yeah. it is really cool. If you go down there, you can just park kind of at the trailhead by North 9th. And, um, and they're using big equipment to move rocks around and the water comes out of the rocks and they put it in the dumper and then it comes up the side of the bank and it's pretty fun to watch. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. I've, uh, I've just this year, I've been hearing about the, uh, the improvements going on up there and that's uh, it's pretty exciting, so. It's great. Awesome. And that trail gets a lot of use from our community. So I think a lot of people have mm -hmm. been able to watch that river improvements going on. I've heard a number of people, number of people comment about how interesting it is to watch the equipment that they're working with. 
I think we all turn into a five-year-old boy then when we start seeing dump trucks and moving rocks and big excavators in the middle of the river. It just, it's cool. Yeah. Okay, one more thing is that they've actually removed part of the river and were able to catch a bunch of fish and then had to relocate them. And the river is really healthy. So it's even, um, there are more fish than we even expected in the river. I got to hear about this um, from Ryan, one of our amazing city engineers. And so um, things are looking really great for that rehabilitation project, just as another quick plug for it. But um, everyone was really happy and a little bit surprised to see that there was, it was already so healthy, lots of bugs, good fish, things like that, big fish too. Great. Okay, I don't think I've lost track. I think we have a motion and a second on the table. And I just, I, I knew that Mr. Clamp usually had a good question and I just apologize for not getting to him before the motion and the second. Um, but we have those on the table to, um, to approve ordinance 25-24 on first reading. So now we'll take a vote. Barbara Bynum. Aye. Doug Glassbell. I'm sorry, Doug, you were muted. I'm Aye. Aye. Um, Roy Anderson? Aye. Dave Bowman? Aye. Dave Frank? I'm sorry, Mr. Frank, I missed yours as well. Aye. Thank you. Mayor I'm Biden. sorry, I'm kind of, my, my voice a little scratchy. No worries. Thank you. Okay, unanimous vote, correct? Great. Okay, we have a unanimous vote on that. We are moving on to item 15 which is ordinance 2519 on second reading. Um, and this is council consideration of um, an ordinance on second reading that amends ordinance 2490. And it does a lot of other things. And I'm gonna let, well, I guess I should read it all into the record. So it amends ordinance 2490, which appropriated funds for defraying the expenses and liabilities of the city of Montrose, Colorado during the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2020, said expenditures of the city of Montrose over and above those anticipated at the time of the adoption of the original budget for the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2020. I will turn it over to the city's finance director, Shaney Wittenberg, who can um, basically remind us how we do an, uh, an amended uh, budget at the end of every year. Good evening, Mayor Bynum and city councilors. So ordinance 2519 is before you tonight on second reading, as the mayor just mentioned. No changes have been made since you reviewed it. I reviewed it with you on November 30th. Um, so basically, just to answer your question, a supplemental budget is what we call it. And it is basically to um, capture those items that we didn't anticipate during the budget um, in 20. 19 when we were developing the 2020 budget. So grants, um, a large portion of this supplemental budget is the CARES Act funding that we could not have anticipated. Um, so it's basically, if you take it really simple, um, if in 2019, ordinance 2490 allocated $100 to be appropriated for um, expenses in 2020, and then we spent 150, we would need a supplemental budget to increase it by that $50. So that is what we're doing um, in several funds. And um, there was a list in the November 30th work session packet. We went through in depth. And then again, um, it was in the packet for December 1st. So I will entertain any questions anybody has. And if you'd like me to go through them one by one, I could do that as well. Thank you. It's a, a supplemental budget, not an amended budget. That would be really complicated if we amended a whole budget. It's a supplemental. Thanks. Um, does anyone have any questions or want to go over any of the items in particular? We we did it first at a work session and then we did it on, on the first reading. So unless someone has a particular question, I don't think we need to go through it line by line. So I'm seeing a lot of shaking of heads. Um, does anyone have any comments or questions? Okay, then I will um, entertain public comment, which is what we do for an ordinance's second reading is public comment. And I don't see anyone asking us about our supplemental budget. So I will turn it back over to council for either comments, questions or motion. Well, 
make a motion to adopt ordinance 2519 on second reading as presented. I'll, I'll second it. <clears throat> Thank you. We have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Glassball and a second by Councilor Anderson. So we'll take a vote. Harper Bynum? Aye. Doug Glassball? Aye. Roy Anderson? Aye. Lee Bowman? Aye. Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Okay, moving along to item 16. This is ordinance 2520, and it's the second reading of this ordinance. And it does a whole lot of things. So I'll, I'll ask, because we're joined by both of our assistant city attorneys, in terms of the process and being official, do I need to read the whole thing into the record um, that's on the agenda? You guys are the attorneys, so somebody nod or shake their head. Do I need to read it all into the no, record? No, you don't. And if uh, if you still want it read, you can have Rachel or Matt read it in. Okay, I'm just I, you know in the I'm in the interest of time and, and moving us along. Um, I think that we can turn it over to um, to our assistant city attorneys who can remind us that how and what we're updating in our city um, codes here with this ordinance. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good evening, members of the city council. Um, we are affecting or adding six code provisions within Title VI with this uh, ordinance, Ordinance 2520. Uh, we worked on this at a work session held November 16, 2020, where a draft was presented to council where it was the only agenda item. Uh, it was then submitted with some edits to council at a regular session held December 1st. Uh, a clean copy of the ordinance is on pages 64 through 71 of tonight's packet. And the red line from the December 1st session is on pages 72 through 80. There were no changes between December 1st and the first reading and that review and now. Um, the two purposes in general for this code update is it's intended to address certain issues with enforcement presented by the code uh, as those have been encountered in the Montrose Municipal Court over the years. Um, specifically with this trespass to broaden that definition to include, for example, a prohibit moving into a closed public bathroom or closed park, uh, or that indecent conduct uh, now includes overt sexual acts in public and or reflect actual enforcement practices within the city. Um, it was not the practice to have our sole code enforcement officer cite persons with outdoor fire pits who are not grilling or cooking food with the violation of the fire ordinance. So we've cleaned that up and made that um, more conforming to uh, actual practice within the city. The second is we're intending to add or clarify our municipal criminal ordinances, which all these are, to draw from some of the standards used in state law. Um, it benefits and furthers procedural due process when a criminal code defines not just the substantive crime, but also the couple of mental states, uh, which is the first section of the proposed uh, ordinance to commit those crimes. Um, so citizens have fair notice of what the code in fact prescribes. Uh, it also furthers judicial review and it leads to better litigation for all parties involved, defense, prosecution, um, and the court. Uh, in terms of questions, I'm prepared to, uh, and my colleague and I are prepared to address any uh, sections that are of interest to either the council or the public. Um, you're muted. Thank you. Yeah, it does give me a big warning after I embarrass myself by saying a whole sentence. Um, thank you. I know you have spent a lot of time working on this, and I think it's really important that we take the opportunity to go through our municipal ordinances and clean them up and make sure they are working the best that they can. Um, and the, the work is really in the details of that kind of thing. So thank you both for all of your hard work. Um, does council have any questions? We We've talked about it at a work session. We talked about it the first time around. Mr. Clamp, do you have any questions ab about cleaning up municipal ordinances and, and making them be the best they can be? Uh, maybe just one thing. Uh, you spoke, uh, Mr. S Assistant Attorney, about um, changing some codes on uh, relating to um, criminals and uh, mental conditions. By mental conditions, could you address that a little bit more just more in the details of that, what that entails? Sure. So every crime has a, as a component a culpable mental state in addition to a criminal act um, in general. Some offenses like traffic offenses are strict liability that don't call for a mental state. 
But for the most part, if you're charged in state court with a crime, it generally has a mental state attached to it. Um, the state law has four different levels of mental states and they work on a hierarchy. The highest is with intent or criminal intent. Lowest is criminal negligence. Between those is knowingly or willfully and then recklessly. Um, so the cur current code um, uses some of those terms, but it doesn't define them uh, anywhere. So what we're doing is basically bor borrowing from the state code definitions in 18.1501, and there's one section of 18.1503 in there, of defining what the culpable mental states are, the four, and then setting them out so they're expressed in our code. And again, it's part of notice to people that um, you know, when they're charged with a crime, this is, these are all the elements and these are the Parstat definitions for the mental state. If the act, if the crime calls for a knowing or willful mental state, there's a definition in there now for it. So in kind of non-legalese, would this be saying that, for example, this is saying it, it, when someone commits a crime, were they, did they mean to do it? Did they plan on it? Did that kind of thing? And, and it does not mean that maybe they have a, a mental illness that should be taken into consideration. That word mental state, when I first saw it, I wondered if that had something to do with not their intent when they committed the crime, but their intent um, day to day, how they live their life. And that's not what this means, correct? Right. Correct. These set out a couple of mental states. Um, it, it, these don't set out like an affirmative defense uh, or an excuse-based defense. Some things can be, um, some things can cancel out a mental state. For example, um, voluntary intoxication can, can be a, a type of defense, it's called traverse defense, to with intent, the highest mental state. Um, so in general, this, these mental states have to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt as part of the crime. Um, mental illness and uh, insanity or that, that sort of thing can be used as a um, uh, excuse-based defense or affirmative defense at times, um, but that has to be raised by the defendant. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Okay then we will um, accept public comment on the second reading of this ordinance. And I'll just check and see if anyone is raising their hand. I don't see anyone. So I'll turn it back over to council for a motion. To adopt ordinance 2520 on second reading as presented. A second that. Great, we've got a first by Councilor Frank and a second by Mayor uh, Pro Tem Glasgow. So let's vote. Harper Bynum? Aye. Doug Glasgow? Aye. Roy Anderson? Aye. Nick Bowman? Aye. Nick Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Great, thank you very much. Okay, next on our agenda tonight is an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Montrose and the Montrose Recreation District regarding the shared services between the two organizations. And I will turn it over to grant coordinator, Kendall Kramer. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, City Council. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen here real quick and that way you can see uh, what we're gonna be talking about. Can everybody see the IGA before them? Excellent. So before you tonight is the intergovernmental agreement between the Montrose Recreation District and the City of Montrose for shared services. This is an agreement that comes before Council on an annual basis um, in an effort to kind of streamline services and essentially save tax dollars uh, for our community. Um, and so each year we sit down and review this agreement with the Rec District. Um, I'm happy to say that this year there are very few changes, all of them minor. Um, the rec district, uh, their district board has approved this IGA. They did that on Thursday, uh, December 10th. I think that was a Thursday. Um, and so tonight I'm sharing with you uh, additional information uh, about the changes, um, excuse me, the changes in the document. There have been, uh, the rec district did not suggest any more changes, uh, their board. So 
um, everything that was presented at our council work session um, is uh, is the same. Um, would you like me to go through the entire document and go over those changes or just briefly uh, discuss the changes um, here um, that were presented? You know, I think because we went through them all at work session, right? I mean, everything, it's the same as what we did at work session. So I don't think that we need to go through it again. I think that's why we take that time in work session. Um, and we can use our time instead for specific questions that counselors or our youth counselor might have or anything in particular you think needs to get pointed out. Okay, great. Um, I don't think that there's anything, uh, like I said, since the rec district approved uh, the IGA, there, there were no changes. They were very happy with the document. Um, and it really speaks to, to Barry Steinbach and Jeremy Master over at the rec district and their excellent work and their team um, to, to have a successful agreement in place. And um, also to note that this agreement uh, will be effective January 1st, which is excellent. Um, last year, I think our agreement went into effect in February. Um, so we're happy to have uh, the document approved uh, for the beginning of 2021. Um, so really looking forward to that. Fantastic. Does anyone, um, including Mr. Clamp, have any questions for Mr. Kramer about this IGA between the city and the rec district? Great. Well, I will just reiterate what Mr. Kramer said at the beginning, um, that these two organizations have partnered um, together like this for about seven years. And in the end, what it does is save our shared taxpayers money, because when we can share services between the two organizations for the economies of scale and deferring expertise to one organization or the other, in the end, it's um, it's our community and our taxpayers who come out ahead. So I think it shows good cooperation between local government entities. And I'm, I'm really proud of this document. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks for the work on it. Okay, that being said, does anyone, would anyone like to make a motion? Mayor, I'll make a motion to approve the intergovernment agreement between the city of Montrose and the Montrose Recreation District regarding shared services as presented. Second that. Great, we've got a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Glassball and a second by Councillor Bowman. And so we'll take a vote. Oh, you know what? I didn't do public comment. And I just, you know, I got all the way through. I, I almost did it 100%, but I messed up. Um, I'll ask if there's any public comment before we vote on the IGA between the Rec District and the city. There isn't, but I remember to ask in the nick of time. Okay, now we'll vote. Barbara Bynum. Aye. Doug Glassbell? Aye. Roy Anderson? Aye. Dave Bowman? Aye. Frank? Aye. Mayor Bynum, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank you, Mr. Kramer, again, for your work on this. Thank you. Um, next on our agenda, we move on to item 18, which is staff reports. And the first and only thing on the agenda under staff reports is the sales use and excise tax report. And I will turn it over to um, the city finance director, Shani Wittenberg, to lead us through that. Thank you again. And let me share my screen so you can all see what I am seeing. Um, can you see that? I could probably make it a little bit bigger. How about that? All right. So this is the sales use and excise tax collection report for October 2020. General fund sales and use tax is collected at 3%. October compared to October of 2019, retail sales tax is up 13.3%. Construction use tax up 105.7%. Use and auto use tax is down 7.5% with total collections up 13.6% and a budget variance for October of 16.2%. Year to date, our retail sales tax is up 6.8% or just about $920,000. Construction use tax is up 34.2% or $136,000.
Use and auto use taxes down 6.2% or $69,000 with total collections up 6.6% or approximately $987,000. Our budget variance is a positive 8.8 .8 or $1.3 million more has been collected through October than we anticipated in the budget. Public safety sales and use tax, the voters approved this extra 0.58% uh, that went in of, into effect January 1 of this year. In October, we collected $329,494. Year to date, our budget variance is a positive 10.2% or $289,000. Montrose Recreation District, we've been collecting an extra 0.3% as voted on in April of 2014. And in October, we collected $170,428, or 12.2% more than we did in October of 2019, with year-to-date collections at $1,617,502, or 6.4% more than we did in 2019 through October. Excise taxes adds 0.9 for hotel tax and 0.8 for restaurant tax to the basic sales tax. In October, hotel excise tax was down 7.2%. Restaurant excise tax is up 11.8% with total collections up 7.6% and a positive budget variance in October of 11.2%. Year-to-date collections for hotel excise tax is down 18.7% or $20,000. Restaurant excise tax year-to-date down 2% or $8,000 with a total down 5.6% or $28,000, and then year to date, a negative budget variance of 2.4% or $12,000. Retail sales enhancement, that's the portion of the vendor's fee that they give up to promote retail sales in Montrose. And in October, we collected $40,278, or almost 30% more than we did in October of 2019. Um, please note that that is mainly due to the public safety sales tax going into effect. So they had a larger collection to um, for the retail, for the vendor's fee to be calculated on. And then year-to-date collections of $378,000, $378,393 or 24.4% more year-to-date than we did in 2019. And with that, I will entertain any questions you all may have. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from council or from our youth counselor about our sales use and excise tax report? Counselor Anderson, no. I see your hand. Yeah, <clears throat> can I just sort of make a comment and perhaps it's a question as well, but in, in virtually every case that you showed except the restaurants and hotel, the budget variance was was always positive and in some cases kind of large and so that's that's <laughs> trying to say this right um when we did those budgets and and you conservatively estimated what we would um gain in in those tax revenues this was well before covid we didn't know anything about what was going to transpire in 2020 and yet we've done very good based on on your anticipated you know revenues um and and i think that's uh, <clears throat> well a tribute to good to good budgeting and estimating and also to um, the good fortune our economies experience during these difficult times um i think as a community we've done pretty well um might comment on how accurately I, I represented that. <laughs> and, I, and I think, Roy, a lot of the um, increase is a lot to do with people staying in Montrose. I don't believe there's been a lot of people traveling outside um, for regular shopping trips. Um, so that would be my theory on that. So I'm hopeful that they've, they, you know, the trend keeps going, but yes, thank you. Any other comments or questions? 
no questions, but I would be happy to give a youth council report uh, before we close up the meeting as well. Fantastic. That is a great idea. And I think we'll go ahead and we'll do that. Um, why don't you tell us what's going on with uh, the youth council? Yeah. All right. So as you probably know, this year, the youth council is running off of a month by month uh, project based program. So in this month of December, uh, we're working on our time capsule project. Um, started that mid last month with planning uh, and then early this month up till now what we've been able to achieve um, we have three item collection locations um, four items for the time capsule uh, one at city hall one at the recreation center and one at the county courthouse um, so that's going well some of the youth counselors have contributed items as well um, we uh, just, it was either today or tomorrow, had it announced we had a new item from the Rotary Club, so they're participating as well. Uh, we've written up a youth council letter to the citizens in 2070. And uh, also, we have uh, written a letter to the uh, Colorado Governor's Office um, in the old 1970 capsule, there was a letter from uh, Governor John A. Love. He, he was asked to predict the sort of economy and infrastructure of Montrose in 2020 and uh, predicted it pretty well. So we wrote the governor's office for the same purpose, uh, see what Governor Polis believes Montrose will look like in 2070. So we would expect a response on that before long. Um, also, this week, we expect to be able to get dimensions uh, to Jim Scheid at Public Works uh, for the time capsule. We're anticipating, I think, most of the city councilors were there to see it when we opened the other time capsule. Uh, we are anticipating using a container about the same size and shape as that one. So we'll have that to him soon. And... We've also done a lot of outreach um, as far as getting awareness out there that we're doing it and that there are some item collection spots around town. So we've been able to do several posts on social media. Uh, we've been able to write up a press release uh, and a newspaper ad as well. So lots of big things going on. Uh, the deadline for item collection is this Friday, the 18th, and our anticipated weather permitting burial date for the capsule is Friday the 28th. So a lot going on. That is so exciting. And Mr. Clamp, thank you so much for not calling me out. I will fess up. I, I owe you a letter. I, I did agree to write a letter from the mayor of Montrose to the citizens of Montrose in 2070. Um, and that is a lot of pressure. I write a lot of emails every day on behalf of city council to constituents, but writing to the citizens of 2070 feels like a huge amount of pressure. Um, but I, I will do that. And I will, um, even if I have to drive it around to my fellow counselors for their signature, we um, will get that to you guys so we can be included in the time capsule as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, we, we won't need to start putting items in the capsule for at least a week so um so we will need that by then don't rush it i mean i may actually write a personal letter to put in there to the youth and city councilors of 2070 and i know it's definitely going to take a lot of thought because it it is weird because 50 years ago the world was so different it, it's going to be different 50 years from now and knowing that you're writing to a completely new new time period is uh pretty neat and uh, yeah but definitely we appreciate you taking that on and also yeah if you could get signatures from the other city councilors that would be a pretty neat touch as well i will and um i had the opportunity to read the letter that the mayor wrote 50 years ago um, and he talked about um, our city and he talked about how we were expanding and we were putting in new subdivisions like english gardens and that roads were always a concern um, it was 1970, and he talked about it, uh, amazing technology and advancements in technology that were happening. And he talked about um, race relations in our country were um, 
a top issue that a lot of people were talking about. And I can't help but reflect how no matter how much things change, things stay the same. Um, and I want to write a letter that is, is as good as the one I had the opportunity to read from the mayor from 1970. Um, but it is a lot of pressure. So if any of my fellow counselors want to submit a, a piece of the letter, just send it to me and I'll incorporate it. How about that? I'm pawning off. I'm delegating. We'll each write a piece of it. Um, no, I just, and I'll get that to you guys. And I think it's really cool that the youth council is taking on this project because um, you all will um, be around in 50 years and, and you'll be interviewed by the newspaper. Um, hopefully local journalism is still thriving in 50 years and you'll be interviewed and you can talk about how you remember um, putting it in the ground. So I really think it's great that our youth council took this project on. It makes it really meaningful. Right. And it, it is a big burden to take this on, especially because kind of got our year our term started and then we just had to get going right with it and get to it pretty quickly but it's a big burden but it's one that we're proud to have for sure and uh, we're definitely gonna gonna get it done and all the hard work in 2070 assuming we're all still here in Montrose to see that the ceremony then it's gonna be pretty satisfying to know 50 years before as as just youth you know we put that together so it's definitely exciting so I think that's really cool does anyone have any questions for um, Mr. Clamp about the time capsule or anything that Youth Council is working on? I'm just going to say I may have a hard time trying to be here at that next next capsule opening, but I'll give it a shot. Yeah, I I think um, that could be said for all of us. Well, you, you hardly look a day over 35, so <laughs> I'm pretty sure you'll be able to make it to there. I will be a hundred years old if we make if I make it to 2070. So uh -huh. um, that would be amazing. But you know, technology is changing all the time. Okay. So, are there any other under staff reports? Um, I see that Chief Hall joined us, and I don't know if that means maybe perhaps he has an update about something, or he's just here if we have questions. But um, I see him in our meeting. I, I'm just here if you have questions. I don't necessarily have. Uh, much of an update tonight. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, in that case, I will ask um, our assistant city manager, do you, Ms. Morgan Thaler, have anything in particular that you need to update council or the public on tonight? Thank you, Mayor. I do not have any specific updates, but um, I'm here if you have questions and I see some of our other department heads are as well. Thanks. So now I will turn it over to my fellow city councilors for um, either comments or questions, um, anything that's on your mind, I see Councillor Anderson has unmuted himself, so I'll turn it over to you. Well, I get the first opportunity. Um, this is our last meeting of 2020. Uh, be glad to see this year go to uh, the past. And I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a better, happy 2021. <laughs> Absolutely. Mayor Pro Tem Glasgow. I'd just like to comment. I think Roy covered it pretty well. But I think it's been a very difficult year, and I think it's fantastic the way that our city staff have managed to keep us going. We've been in and out. We've had difficulties with those, and I think that we've come through this with flying colors, and I think it's certainly uh, because of the, the quality of the people that we have supporting us. And Merry Christmas to them and thank everybody. Councillor Frank or Councillor Bowman? No, okay. Well, oh, Councillor Bowman? Just Merry Christmas to everybody. It's been a hard year. We're all looking forward to 2021. We'll see you then. Absolutely. And, um, and, I'll, and I'll just put out that I hope everyone enjoys the holidays and stays safe and stays warm and keeps your immediate family close to you and keeps your further family in your thoughts and that you can talk to them on the phone or, or see them on Zoom. Um, I haven't seen my parents in over a year and I think that is the longest time in, in my life that I haven't seen my parents. But um, I'm lucky that they are still safe and um, doing okay. I've had a few friends this week who've lost their parents in the last week or two. And I, I just want everyone to know that um, 
that we are thinking about them and that as your city leaders, um, we are doing our absolute best day in and day out to take care of our city and to take care of, of the job that we signed up for when we um, took on city council. And none of us knew it would involve uh, a pandemic, but I commend not only the staff, but my fellow counselors for rolling up their sleeves and working really hard. And I know that they all have the citizens of this community in their hearts. So unless anyone has any further comments, I think, I'll, oh, Madison. I'll just say real quick. Uh, yeah, it's definitely been a we weird year, especially, um, but, but as someone who is in contact with the city through youth council and down at the visitor center, I'll just say um, like other counselors uh, before me just indicated, uh, the city really came through it well. I think uh, the whole pandemic situation was managed well. We managed um, to do what was what was safe, what was right, uh, while still keeping our economy afloat, keeping our businesses downtown uh, thriving, thriving and healthy. And uh, what I saw in that budget, there was really encouraging all the collections up, sales up. Um, all of that's really good to see. I think, you know, one big benefit of not being able to travel a lot this year was um, people may have been more inclined when they did their shopping, do it right here, uh, benefiting all our great local businesses. And um, so it was a tough year. There were definitely some, some bright sides to it, though, and uh, definitely fortunate to live here uh, this year because it was just on every level of city management, it was went really smoothly and everyone did really well. So, and here's to a, a better 2021. Absolutely. I think we can end on that note. Um, and so I'll take a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. So moved. Have a wonderful evening. See you in 2021. Thanks.